want to welcome to our Wednesday, 11.30 a.m. lunch and Bible study from Doctrine and Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We want to thank you for attending us. I hope maybe you're having lunch with us today from your home or from wherever your business might be. Uh, we are in a series of lessons called Grieving the Holy Spirit, taken from Ephesians 4, and we've been studying them from verses 25 through 32. The, Paul talks about it. Now, verse 30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, and that whole section is about grieving the Holy Spirit, so he tells you don't grieve the Holy Spirit uh, in that section. So we call this section Grieving the Holy Spirit. These are the different ways. This is lesson five, taken from Ephesians 4, 20, uh, we, about 24, 25, from verse 25, 32. And we're in our fifth lesson. Last week, uh, we studied uh, grieving the Holy Spirit by stealing what belongs to other people out of uh, Ephesians 4, 20, not, uh, 4, 28. We learned that stealing, the whole concept of stealing, both in the Old Testament and like the, Ten Commandments, as well as in the New Testament, like in our passage, um, 428 of Ephesians, that it actually, what, what the doctrine that is taught by the concept of God saying don't steal is the, di is the idea of private ownership. And a principle as simple as that, that has been part of our cultural way of thinking in America even when I was a small child in school, we thought that way. Our community thought that way. It, we need to have a, a, re, a reteaching, a, a relearn the principle of why stealing? Because of private ownership. And now we're in a, we're in a, a time period in our, our nation where they're talking about communal equality again. You can't steal when you have communi community, uh, communal equity of property. It belongs to everybody. And so stealing reminds us of the, of the doctrine of private ownership, which is a very key part of uh, the whole principle of employment under free enterprise system. Well, we talked about that the last time. Uh, you can go back and pick that up all from doctrinal studies uh, dot com internet we also learned that one of the great blessings of employment in verse 28 was ch being charitable to other people uh, who had dire needs there they had necessities of life needs god gives you surplus now let me tell you another principle about surplus that we talked about surplus means that you don't always live to everything you make. You, you determine a lifestyle that you want, that you're comfortable with, that's not extravagant, Gary, and it doesn't put you in debt all the time. You find something you can live by. You accept that lifestyle principle, and when, you, when God gives you surplus, it is to give, be charitable to other people in need. That would be people under where your economics would be, it would be people that have less than what you have. And once again, we've lost charitable ideas. People today live right out to the extent of their income and beyond. You've got to change that whole lifestyle of thinking. Well, anyhow, this is a biblical concept. And so we, people don't understand that anymore. We live in a, uh, a young generation coming up into employment has no clue of what I just taught. And somebody's got to start teaching it again, and I guess it'd be us. So today, we're going to look at unwholesome words out of Ephesians 4.29. We're going to look at four, four ideas. Uh, we're going to look at four points on this subject matter. Grieving the Holy Spirit by on what the scriptures call unwholesome words proceeding from the mouth of a believer. So this will be our subject matter today after a word of prayer. Remember the Bible, a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. 
You can't learn it nor live it in carnality, evidence of carnality, living in the flesh and not in the spirit. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in the Christian life. It could be mental attitude type of sin, sins of the tongue, which we're going to talk about today, or it could be overt sins. What do I have to do to get out of carnality in the Christian life and back into spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What must I do? 1 John 1, 9. I pick that because I like it because of the word cleansing. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word cleansing goes back to verse 7, 1 John 1, 7, and takes us back to the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sin, past, present, and future. For the Christian life, he goes to the cross, not, not for salvation. He already has that from Adamic sin. He goes back to the cross in confession of sin to be cleansed from carnality to spirituality. You must learn that. Your Christian life will take off like gangbusters if you will learn these simple principles. Well, today we're going to take a look at 429. If you have your Bibles, would you open them with me? And then we'll have a word of prayer. Here's what it says. Let no unwholesome word, that's what we're after, proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, building up the person rather than tearing them down. Edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. A powerful passage on the subject of do not let unwholesome words leave your mouth and be destructive in another person's life when what should come out of your life is the good word of grace and the hope of rebuilding their lives. Oh, I hope you get that. That's my lesson today after a word of prayer. Remember that for you, this hour moment of prayer here is to make sure your sins are confessed. You, you bow your head, close your eyes, and confess your sin that has got you in carnality. Get back, because you can't study the Bible in carnality. The Bible don't understand it. The world don't understand the Bible. It takes the Holy Spirit of God to teach you the Bible. John chapter 14, 15, 16. Let's study. Father, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. I thank you, Father, for the extension of the work of Christ on the cross to the Christian life by confession of sin to get me out of the flesh, out of the sin nature, out of carnality of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, and back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is where the dynamics of the life of Christ is in our, in our souls. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing I want to do in point one is divide the verse 29 into two sections. If you have a study guide, uh, you, could, you can pull them down every, each week. There, uh, John Dyer puts them on our web for you. You pull them down and you'll have your notes. If not, a, pencil, a piece of paper and a pencil will do it. Point number one, in today's lesson, we will learn that in the English, the word unwholesome words from the mouth of a believer grieves the Holy Spirit. Verse 30, verse 29 connected with 30. I want to begin by dividing my lesson text into two parts. The first part I'm going to call bad and the second part I'm going to call blessings. So I want to divide it in two parts. Here's the first part, verse 29, that I call Bad, bad communications as opposed to blessing communications. Here it is. Here's the first part, bad communications. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. That's the first part. I title that bad, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Here's the second part, blessings of communications. But in contrast to unwholesome words, only such a word from your mouth, 
only such a word as is good, that is agathos good, that is good that God has signed off on. God is good. His word is good. Therefore, let that come out. That's the good word. Only such a word as is good for edification. Okidomai is the word. It means to build up, not to tear down. And then he says, according to the need of the moment. Isn't that interesting? Because actually what we're dealing with is a person. Don't let, don't let an unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but a word as is good for edification, building a person up rather than tearing them down in the need of a moment. I thought that was interesting because most of the time when you hear somebody talk about this after the fact, they call it the heat of a moment. Well, they just made me mad, and I just told them what I thought about it. I just gave it to them. See, that wasn't considering the need of the moment. That was the heat of the moment. See, the need of the moment takes the other person in consideration more than yourself. No, oh, I hope I'm talking to somebody today. I know I'm talking to Ron Adema, but who else am I talking to? I'm going to say this again because you're missing it. You're reading this verse and not getting it. That's the reason I broke them down. The blessing side, but in contrast, letting unwholesome words, only a word that is good, the word of God, that is for edifying according to the need of the moment, not the heat of the moment, the need of the moment. Well, I gave them my two cents worth. Boy, I, 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 I drug them over the coals. That was the heat of the moment. That wasn't the need of the moment. Oh, please, please, please. This is the word of God that's speaking to you. According to the need of the moment, so that it may give, you see, that's Hena plus the subjunctive, so that it may give, did my aorist active subjunctive grace to those who are listening to the hearer, to those who have ears, those who are listening, those who are getting the heat of the moment and need the need of the moment met. It's a ministry. And you're ignoring it. You're running over them with a semi-truck. What God wants you to do is give them a good word from the word of God, something that can build their souls up in the need of the moment so that it will give grace, that it will give God's grace to those who are listening, who those who are caught up in the moment. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I hope you have ears to hear. Now let's go back and let's take a look. Bad. You say to me, Ron, why do you, well, I just <laughs> kind of showed you why it's bad. But the word unwholesome word. Now the word is logos, like the word of God. But the word unwholesome is sapros, S-A-P-R-O-S. Sapros. Let me tell you what sapros means. I mean, we, we were, we're in the English, we're struggling, unwholesome. Unless you understand what unwholesome is. We're struggling because this word in the Greek language means bad. It means bad, it means corrupt, rotten. See, this word, the root of this word. Sapros, the root is S-E-P-O, S-E-P-O. That's the verbal form of this word, and it means to rot. 
In the Bible, it's used for vegetables. If, they're, if the vegetables were good, they called them good vegetables that come from uh, good plants. If it's fruit, they say it's good fruit that comes from good, good trees, fruit trees. It was used with vegetables. It was used with fruit. It was used with fish in the Bible. You see, there's, there's a, it, it means fit, unfit for use or consumption, the word unwholesome. Oh, you're not going to eat that. That's rotten. I mean, do you know when you're eating something that's wholesome as opposed to unwholesome, when you put something in your mouth that's rotten, does your brain not go like, what are you doing? That's rotten. It means unfit for use. It means perishable, that you're eating something that's perishable, that's in a state of perish. You're eating something or, or involved in something that is unfit for consumption. That is our word, unwholesome word. The word proceed is our command. We always pay attention to these commands, especially in our study. And we had 11 of them. 25 through 32. The command proceed is a present middle imperative. The middle voice is a deponent because it, the verb ends in an O-M-A-I. And so it goes back to the original meaning of the word. Proceed out from something, going forward with something. Something is now out, and it needs to go down the line. If you are on an assembly line, something's put there, and it's gone through the conveyor belt till it gets someplace. Once it's out, it's on the conveyor belt. Once it's out, it's on the conveyor belt, and it ain't done till it, it hits wherever that. One year, I worked for Brunswick, bo made bowling balls, made them. I was on a team of four or five, one, two, four, f I was on a team of five. I worked one summer after my freshman year of college, Brunswick in Muskegon, Michigan. Worked a graveyard shift with guys and uh, we made bowling balls, and they would come to a certain place. You know, you'd, you'd take the raw stuff, and you'd clamp it into a thing, and you'd put it, burn it, and it'd come out the other end, and you'd grab it and pull it out and push it. went in a conveyor belt, and it wound up down in a basket. When the basket was full, the guy took it to, the, to another station that checked it to make sure it didn't have any defects and it was a good solid bowling ball and there it was. This is that word proceed. Once it's out, once it's on the conveyor belt, it goes until it gets into the end of it, the basket, where then it goes to see whether it, that's the end of it. Unwholesome word, do not. There's a negative with this word, uh, unwholesome do not let it proceed. Do not let it proceed. Let no unwholesome word proceed. See, that's may. That's a negative. Stop doing this. Stop. That's a present imperative. Stop. 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 Stop doing that. Why? It doesn't benefit the person you're running over with a semi-truck. That's not going to benefit him. He's getting a rotten deal. My, my. Come on, guys. Don't let it proceed from your mouth. Once it's out of your mouth, what you going to do? It's got to go down the conveyor belt. You understand that? You understand that unwholesome word? Then the second part of that verse, I called it blessing because of the word grace. Blessing. He says, 
the writer says, Paul says, but, that's Allah in contrast, but, we call it adversative, you know, in the language, but, in contrast, but in contrast, only such a word as is good, agathos, for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let me give you an illustration. We are ready for the day of the crucifixion of Christ. I mean, we're right on the need of the moment of clarity that Christ is come into this world to die for sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15, and he's trying to get his disciples on board with him with the idea that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to go through two mock trials. The Roman Empire and the priest nation of Israel will put him through mock trials to murder him. An innocent man they both knew was innocent. But this was by God's design. Not because of political corrupt, corruptness, but God sent his son into the world to die for the sinner who was on his way to hell. And apart from Jesus Christ, he's going to go. In the Old Testament, it was a prophetic gospel. He will come, he will die on a cross, he will be buried and raised from the dead. In the New Testament, he came, he died on a cross, he was buried, he was raised. We believe in historical gospel. In the Old Testament, I believe in a prophetic gospel. Well, write down Galatians 3, 8 and read it, and you'll know, you'll know the difference in this. Well, so here's Peter. Jesus trying to explain to Peter what I got to do. He's trying to get his disciples on board because he's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to be raised, and he's going to go back to heaven where he came from. And they're going to be left with, the, with uh, the father's business. The oldest son is not going to be there, and the rest of them are going to do it. So he's trying to prepare them. And so in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, he tells Peter this, and Peter goes like, oh, no, 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 quit talking that way. You're upsetting everybody. And Jesus, he says, that's never, that's, listen, that's not going to be, that's not it. That's just, you're just depressing, and this, you need to quit doing that. And he takes him aside in that famous Satan. He says, get me, he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Now, Luke records something really interesting that Matthew didn't tell us. Luke 22, 31, 32, Jesus tells Peter, maybe not in that same conversation, but, but one between there and, and, and him actually dying. He says to Peter, Peter, I want to tell you something. You need to listen to me well. Satan has been before God and the Supreme Council and has requested permission to work you over. And God has granted it. And Satan is going to sift you like wheat. Now listen to what he said. Now look. Here's good words for edification, for the need of the moment that Peter might receive grace 
if he has ears to hear. Listen to what Jesus told him. But Peter, now I just see him put his arm around Peter and pull him in. But Peter, I am praying for you that your faith will not fail God. That your faith will not fail. Listen to these words. And when you recover, you strengthen the brethren. You're going to have a great ministry, Peter, when you recover, and I'm going to pray for your recovery, and when you recover, you're going to have a great ministry from this whole idea of betrayal, of failure, but faith won the day, and you're going to have a great minister to other brethren, other members of the body of Christ because of that. Now, those words, those good words are not going to meet the need, but it will later when Peter comes in Matthew 26, 75 and has betrayed Christ three times just like Jesus said and sees Christ being led out to be crucified and weeps bitterly. That word of God that Jesus gave him is going to become a sharp sword piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, to the joints and the marrow, and become a critic of the thoughts and intentions of Peter's heart. And Peter is going to recover from his failure. And faith is going to win the day. And Peter is going to go on and have a gigantic ministry to others with the message there is a new day after failure in your life if you'll recover. If you'll come back to faith. If you'll come back to faith. If you got somebody in your corner praying for you, you probably have. You probably don't even remember. You're probably a mother, a grandmother, a brother, maybe an entire church. You would be the lucky one. You understand verse 29 now? Don't stop putting unwholesome words on people. Put wholesome words that can edify them. The word of God. They could minister grace in their life in the midst of their failures. They will be Blessed to stop eating rotten food. Like the prodigal son in the pig pen eating rotten food, the food that other people throw away to the pigs. That's rotten. The pigs love it. Prodigal son knows what rotten food is. And on his best day, he can't bring himself to believe that that's good food. And he comes to his senses and he recovers in his faith. Is that you out there today? My prayer would be, stop eating rotten food. Stop trying to get other people to eat the rotten food from your mouth. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? Here's point number two. As a sin of the tongue, unwholesome words are the expressions of the thoughts of the mind and the heart. Oh, please get this one. I'm going to explain it to you. You've got to have a moment of this. As a sin of the tongue, the, old, old, the unwholesome words are the expressions when they come out of your mouth. 
It's because they've been formed in your mind and your heart. <sighs> Hits the conveyor belt and out it goes. Can't get it back. It's going to run its course. As a sin of the tongue, unwholesome words are the expressions of the thoughts of the mind and the heart. They are first exposed by inner dialogue. The first person that hears these are you as you begin to mill them over. It's called inner dialogue. These are the things you tell yourself before you tell other people. It is your dress rehearsal to a sin of the tongue that's going to proceed from your mouth, boom, and it's going to run its course. This is why Paul warns believers such as you and I to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Be sure you read verses 3 through 8. When, do, when should I take every thought captive? When it's there in my mind. When the thought is in my mind in inner dialogue within myself. Then I take it captive to the obedience of Christ. Not when it hits a conveyor belt. You need to clean up your mouth. You're spewing rotten food. You're throwing up on people and telling them it's good food. Or telling them you don't care. It's all you're giving them. My, my, my people, what is wrong with us in the church of Jesus Christ? Proverbs 12, 18. There is one who speaks rashly or recklessly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You spew this stuff out of your mouth, it's like a sword just striking right into the heart of the matter of the person. You should not do that. The tongue should speak the wisdom of God and bring healing to the person according to the need of the moment. What is wrong with the church of Jesus Christ that they can't get this message in their soul and in their life and have an impact in their own family. They're doing this to their own family. You wonder why your children don't want to go to church. Why they don't want to follow the Lord. You're feeding them rotten stuff. Corrupt. How about this one? Proverbs 18, 6 and 7. A fool's lips bring strife, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare of his soul. So that's what I've been trying to explain to you today. That's what I've been trying to explain to you. You want an example of it? in somebody's life other than your own? Joseph and his brothers. We've just come out of a series last year on the life of Joseph. In chapter 37, verse 11, the brothers have a dress rehearsal. They are jealous of Joseph because the way the father treats all the kids in regard to Joseph. They see how the father loves Joseph more than them. Now, probably if you ask the father, he would deny it. But his, the way he, in his actions and his mouth, declares it. The coat of many colors. As in verse 4, in verse 11, 
dress rehearsal, that is milling us over in your hearts, the, the brothers are in absolute jealousy of him. And they hated him. He comes and he gives, he get, tells them a prophetic dream that he had. When they heard that prophetic dream that they would one day bow down before him, that jealousy went into bitterness, malice, and, and absolute hate. And the Bible says they could not speak with Joseph with friendly terms ever again. They hated him. Are you going to be able to speak kindly to somebody you hate with passion or malice? Chapter 37, verses 18 through 20. They're out working away from home in a, another field miles away in pasture with she sheep. And they see Joseph coming because father sent him to get word on what's going on and to bring him some food. When they see him, when they saw him, they plotted to kill him. Now, boy, that's going a long way down the conveyor belt, isn't it? Yeah, it's at the end. In verse 28, instead of killing him, they chose to make some money out of it, and so they sold him to slave traders headed to Egypt. And you know the rest of the story. Well, maybe you don't. You should read chapter 45, verse 7 and 8. Now they're under discipline. And God has got them under the thumb. And they think that it's all because of how they dealt with Joseph. And that's only a small part. It's how they're dealing with God. The way they're treating Joseph is the way they're treating God. Did you know the prodigal son, how he was treating his father? When you read 45, 7 and 8, you find that Joseph has forgiven them. And when he speaks to them, he's going to speak to them with kind words for their edification and for grace to have a root in their life for blessings. Chapter 50, verse 20 is the most famous of that discussion. Joseph is trying to bring healing, edification, healing in his family. This is the victim that's trying to do that. It's a wonderful story, and you should read it. You should read it. I mean, really read it. Try to get something that would affect your life for change. Not just read it to say, I read the book of Joseph. I read all about the life of Joseph. I mean, what did you learn from it that is instrumental in changing your life, putting it into a better place for God? Number three. This point, number three, that I'm about to teach you is so important to your Christian way of life, I can't begin to tell you how important this point is. You must listen to me. Because I'm going to bring all this stuff to a head now in your life. When you enter your inner dialogue and begin to focus on the me rather than on the Christ solution, well, I'll tell you he's done that for the last time in my life. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you. I get. I. It's all, about, it's all about I and me. 
You know what it ought to be? You believer that, that went to the cross and got your salvation by grace through faith, not of yourself as a gift of God. And now you're ready to throw everybody else under the, under the bus because you got your feelings hurt? Your feelings hurt? My goodness, what's wrong with you? Once you get into that inner dialogue and it's all about you, you've got to change that. It should be all about Christ. It should never be about you. It don't matter if your feelings got hurt. You've got to address the need of the moment that brings edification to the other person. Not unwholesome words. The word of God that brings healing. Go back and read Genesis 50, 20 and get an idea. When that inner dialogue becomes all about you and your feelings and how you've been misused and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Listen. It has been granted for your life not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for Christ's sake. Philippians 1, 29. What makes you think you got off some kind of, somehow you're different, and you will not have to go through that? My, you be the light of the world. Everybody tries to snuff it out. What's wrong with you? That's why he tells you not to hide it. Put it out in the open. Sure, you'll take the hits for it, but that's not what it's about. It's about meeting the need of the moment to build somebody up in Christ, not tear them down. When that inner dialogue becomes more about you than about Christ, you've got to change. You are headed, you are headed for unwholesome words to go out and hit that conveyor belt. It is at this point that you must walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit and not in the flesh. If you get in the flesh, which is all about you, if you get in the flesh, that unwholesome word is going to come and it's going to, hit the, it's going to hit the fan. You must not let that. That's why you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. You must go immediately to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Get out of the flesh and get into the Spirit. That's a choice and it's one you've got to make in inner dialogue. My... I hope I'm speaking to somebody today. Somebody, somebody that understands this has got to begin to apply it to their life. Galatians 5, 16, 70, walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, you will not walk in the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, you will not walk in the flesh. Verse 17, these two are at war within every believer who's in control. You are volitionally. Volitionally, you're in charge. You're, you're in charge. So you got to walk in the power of the Spirit. In our dialogue, you got to go to the Holy Spirit. As soon as you begin all about me, 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 you're in the flesh. Get out of it before it becomes sinful. James 1, 14 and 15, read it. It tells you how once it gets in the flesh, how it becomes personal sin. Read Romans 13, 14. I think I'll quote it in a minute for you. First, Galatia, uh, uh, Romans 6, 12. Therefore, do not let sin, sin nature, flesh, reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. You've got to put it down and stop it. Stop it dead in its tracks. Don't let it hit the conveyor belt. Here's Romans 13, 14. But I, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and make no provisions for the flesh. Stop it. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, a, that's, that's your responsibility. Put, go to him. Get out of the flesh. That's old clothes. That's old man stuff. That's not newborn stuff. That's not, God didn't save you for that. You got to be in the new man state of existence. And so he says, therefore, do not let the sin nature reign in your mortal body. Don't let it be a master over you so that you obey the lust. Yeah, once again, James 1, 14, 15, you should study that. Put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lust. Stop doing that. Make no provisions. Make no provisions. Don't plan it out and let it come out and hit the conveyor belt. My, 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 my. I don't know how it could be much plainer. You've got to study this. You've got to get this. Point number four in closing. All categories of mental attitude sins, whether it be sins of the tongue like we're talking about here, or whether it be mental attitude sins that are formed in the mind, or overt sins. All categories of personal sins are covered by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, that takes us to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, it does. Listen to 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also those of the whole world. Why would you want to throw anybody under the bus with your words? Well, I hope you die. Well, where's that come from? You ought to read 2 Corinthians 7, 1. You ought to read Hebrews 9, 13 through 22. And I gave you a home study. There, I listed eight sins of the tongue that fall under unwholesome words that grieve the Holy Spirit. You should study these. I don't have time to do it today. I'm out of time. For example, lying tongues in Proverbs 12, 22. Backbiting tongues, Proverbs 25, 23. Quarreling tongue, Proverbs 17, 14, and James 4, 1 and 2. Gossiping tongue, 1 Timothy 5, 13. A flattering, flattering lips, Proverbs 26, 28. Critical or judgmental tongue, Proverbs, uh, Romans 14, 10. A falsehood tongue, we studied that in Ephesians 4, 25. I think that's what it was. I got it, I got it printed wrong on my paper, but I think it was 25. Yep, falsehood, 25. And then finally, a sl slandering tongue. We'll talk about next time, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. The people also say, well, what, what is sense of the tongue? I, there's just a few. I gave you eight. Proverbs 10, 19. When there are many words, <coughs> they hit the conveyor belt, <coughs> transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from trouble. Therefore, our subject matter today, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to the hearer. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have
come our way? <laughs> I don't know how many stayed with his father. Oh, my goodness. An hour? Oh, that's too long. Oh, he's telling me things I don't want to hear. I'm not going to listen anymore. No, no, this is for ears who have a desire to hear. I don't know what you got ears for, but if you left me during this hour, you don't have ears to hear. If you come back to this tape many years later, in recovery, you will know that I spoke the truth to your heart today. Well, Father, let no unwholesome words proceed from our mouth. They're destructive. They're not for healing. They're for hurting. We need to be better than that. You have, been, you have given us all the grace operating assets to be better than that. It's not that we have to change our life in great ways. We just have to do it God's way. When that inner dialogue is all about me, it needs to be all about Christ. I need to get out of the flesh and get in the spirit. I need to get the word of God working in my life through my mouth. Through my lips and through my life. In Jesus' name, amen.